I want Dr. George to take over and uh, talk about his topic close to heart, CSCR. Thank you, Rajesh, for this opportunity. So uh, some of the imaging biomarkers or imaging in C central serous chorioretinopathy, as we know that there is a, has been a paradigm shift in central serous retinopathy to central serous chorioretinopathy. And from RP disease, now it has moved into the choroidal disease, initially part of the pachychoroid disease spectrum and now into the venous overload choroidopathy spectrum. So as we know, the strep source OCT on, uh, in an acute CSC shows the serous macular detachment overlying a thick choroid with uh, dilated outer choroidal veins. And we see these kind of variants with fibrinous exudation as well as exudative retinal detachment as more complicated uh, types of central serous chorioretinopathy. And it has to be uh, kept in mind that this subretinal neurosensory detachment area can have hyperreflective mm, material signifying the presence of fibrinous uh, uh, material in, as an exudation, even in the present of presence of serous pigment epithelial detachment. So in this particular patient, it is basically a leaking serous PD and uh, this very, uh, it cannot be lasered with a focal laser because, because it, it, it can cause a RP rip and exudative retinal detachment. So when you look at the OCT features in chronic CSR, uh, it is important to note the findings of foveal thinning outer retinal photoreceptor elongation, double layer sign, and uh, even in later cases, you have this intraretinal cystoid spaces signifying the presence of chronic disease and gives a guarded visual prognosis in these findings. And in the last stage of the disease, something called a cystoid macular degeneration, there is no more subretinal fluid, but it's a large cystoid space. And in, in this kind of cases, you get this kind of diffuse RP disease and leakage uh, uh, as a form of diffuse RP epitheliopathy is a, is, is a kind of a diffuse, diffuse uh, sick RP that you get in this kind of a disease. ICG angiography shows uh, uh, this kind of dilated outer choroidal uh, veins or pachy vessels and late choroidal vascular hyperpermeability areas. So uh, in Sepsor's OCT, it is seen that not only the thickened choroid more than 400 microns, but you see this dilated outer choroidal veins with compression of the overlying choriocapillaries, which is a constant finding in these cases with uh, central serous chorioretinopathy. It need not all the time be a diffuse choroidal thickening. It can be a focal choroidal thickening here. So for example, in this case, it's a peripapillary pachychoroid syndrome. You have this nasal macular choroidal thickening with nasal macular intraretinal and subretinal fluid. And uh, usually it happens in older individuals and it's us usually a bilateral disease. You see this peripapillary intraretinal subretinal fluid in these patients. And it's very important to image the autofluorescence in this case where you see the peripapillary RP mottling peripapillary pachy vessels and choroidal vascular hyperpermeability as findings in this, in this variant of CSR called as peripapillary pachy syndrome. So, uh, another, and when you, another variant of the disease is when you have a leaking PED, subfoveal large leaking serous PEDs with fluid, it's a difficult situation to treat. When you look at the angiography, it shows a di diffuse RP disease and leaking pigment epithelial detachment. So in this situation, uh, uh, photodynamic therapy, half-dose PDT, not only resolves the subretinal fluid, but the, even the subfoveal PEDs also resolves in this, uh, in this kind of a situation. So the poor prognostic indicators would be older age group, presence of subfoveal PED and subfoveal fibrin because of the higher PDT toxicity and leading to choreocapillary uh, ischemia and RP atrophy. So as we already mentioned that these kind of cystoid spaces on OCT called a cystoid macular degeneration is a poor prognostic indicator along with this finding of acquired vitelliform lesions or AVL in the presence of chronic CSC and PEDs 
Here you can see that after photodynamic therapy, there is no response. This is before and this is after PDP. Usually it resolves uh, significantly well with uh, this kind of a the finding, but in the presence of AVL, it is a poor prognostic indicator. Another uh, biomarker is the presence of choroidal hyperreflective foci. Usually this is seen in choroidal inflammatory diseases, but in, in chronic CSR also, choroidal hyperreflective foci can be seen. Uh, it was initially suspected that it could be a choroidal inflammation uh, in CSC, but it is now it is resolved that <coughs> overwhelming choroidal vascular hyperpermeability is leading to the subretinal fluid exudation along with choroidal and subretinal cellular extravasation as well. This is especially important when you have a subretinal submacular exudation like this. This is the fibrinous variant of CSC with leaking pigment epithelial detachment as you can see here. But when you have this kind of a exudation at the macula, this is not a CSC with fibrinous exudation. This is a chorioretinitis, early hypo and late hyper on fluorescein angiography. This has to be kept in mind when you see the fibrinous variant of CSC. For example, this case was initially diagnosed as fibrinous variant of CSC with, uh, um, with separate RP is bumpy, undulating RP, bumpy choroid with choroidal hyperreflective foci. So uh, you can see the choroidal hyperreflective foci and subretinal fibrin overlying the undulating RP and thick choroid in both the eyes of this patient, choroidal hyperreflective foci. But when you do the FAI CG, you can see that these hypospots and the disc leakage in both the eyes, it is not a fibrinous CSC, this is a variant, this is a mimicker. You have a Harada's variant of VKH, choroiditis. So it has to be differentiated when you have chronic CSC with choroidal hyperreflective foci and outer retinal hyperreflective foci in this case. This is a variant of CSC. Again, when you do the, uh, when you, when you do the, ang uh, the ICG angiography, you see these packy vessels, choroidal vascular hyperpermeability in both the eyes and diffuse RP epitheliopathy, you differentiate this is a case of chronic CSR with choroidal, uh, choroidal hyperreflective foci and half dose PDT was done for this patient. Another biomarker is posterior choroidal loculation of fluid in CSC. This was described by Spade and colleagues with Trepsol's OCT as common as 60% of the cases with CSC have either a dissociated posterior choroidal fluid loculation or the fluid can interdigitate between the packy vessels in the outer choroid. So it has to be differentiated from packy vessels in a CSC. Here it is fusiform, angulated, and lack of vascular wall, and greater than 250 microns in greatest linear dimensions. So in, this happens when choroid stroma is saturated beyond 400 microns, 400 to 500 microns, and beyond that, amount of fluid accumulation in the choroid, it, it loculates in the outer posterior choroid as choroidal fluid loculation. So we had published in this regard saying that the posterior choroidal fluid loculation in fact can present as a rare variant of pachychoroid disease as choroidal mass lesion. For this patient, for example, presented as a choroidal mass lesion, inferior part of the macula, and you see this choroidal elevation, this is not a choroidal lesion but it is the outer dissociated outer choroidal posterior loculation of fluid and fluid at the macula as well. And you see the, the, the posterior choroidal loculation of fluid and this patient at presentation and after three months, the posterior choroidal loculation has resolved by its own. Another patient, again, posterior choroidal loculation of fluid and you can see that a lumpy, bumpy choroidal elevation like a metastasis, choroidal metastasis. But then with epilineron, this patient's choroidal loculation has disappeared, mimicking a posterior cho um, choroidal mass lesion. It's a rare finding or biomarker in CSC. So now coming to the on OCT through the choroid has shown that intervortex anastomosis at the macula can happen in 90% of cases of central serous chorioretinopathy as well as 100% of PCV eyes. So you, you normally it should be like this. There should be a watershed zone at the macula, horizontal raphe. But in CSC, you can see on on first OCT non-invasive, there is the breach of the watershed zone. There is intervortex anastomosis here, giving a new posterior choroidal drainage route 
between the superior and interior, in, inferior vortex vein, which is congested in, in CSN, central serous chorea retinopathy, because of the choroidal venous outflow abnormalities. And this intervortex anastomosis gives an alternate pathway for the drainage. In PCV also, as a pachychoroid disease, it can have intervortex anastomosis, intervortex vein anastomosis at the macula. So with the newer ICGA um, in, uh, angiography, it has been that in more than 80% of the case of CSE, you can have the congested vortex vein ampullae corresponding to the quadrant of choroidal vascular hyperpermeability, suggesting that we are looking at CSE as a disease with choroidal outflow, choroidal venous outflow uh, congestion or abnormality. So in this regard, it, is, it, is, it was shown first by Spade and then others that in, in CSC, there is a normal breach of this horizontal watershed zone uh, um, at, along the horizontal raffae, where in, in CSC, there could be this large caliber vessels crossing the uh, horizontal raffae and obliterating the watershed zone with intervortex anastomosis. In peripapillary variant of CSC, you can have this intervortex anastomosis around the optic disc and uh, not at the macula. In CSE, you have it at the macula. In peripapillary, you can have it around the optic disc. So of late, now there's a new group of diseases wherein it is common, the intervortex anastomosis, choroidal venous congestion, dilated outer choroidal veins, and choroidal vascular hyperpermeability with choroidal thickening. Along with CSE and peripapillary pachychoroid, it can be uveal effusion syndrome and carotid cavernous fistula as well. Uh, uh, belonging to this spectrum of diseases and giving the same patho pathology of intervortex anastomosis and choroidal vascular congestion as in CSC, but in here you see in car carotid cavernous fistula and as well as uveal effusion syndrome, a similar uh, kind of intervortex anastomosis happening. And last, lastly, moving to the last entity that is OCT angiography in CSC, you see these dark areas, dark spots, and abnormal choroidal vessels. These dark areas corresponding to the choriocapillary layer suggest a choriocapillary ischemia corresponding to the area of subretinal fluid on OCT B scan. And these dark spots usually in the corresponds to the pigment epithelial detachment, co-registered pigment epithelial detachment on OCT B scan. And these low flow areas of hyperflow areas of um, dark areas usually overlaps the pachyvessel area in, in, in Swepsor's OCT and signifies the presence of inner, inner choroidal ischemia or choriocapillary ischemia that is causing the pathogenesis of central serous uh, choreoretinopathy. It is hypothesized that there is an inner choroidal ischemia le leading, to the, leading to the pathogenesis of this disease. And um, abnormal choroidal vessel, again a finding in chronic CSC, where you have this ball of wool pattern or an indistinct tangle pattern. These are the two patterns seen in chronic CSC when you have a type 1 CNVM associated in chronic CSR. So why you need octa in CSC or in chronic CSC? Why? Because type 1 neovascularization can be present in chronic CSR, especially in the setting of intraretinal cystoid spaces. And because there is a Fluorescin and ICG angiography can show diffuse fluorescin leakage or co diffuse choroidal vascular hyperpermeability. These type 1 membranes, which are subtle neovascularizations, can be missed on routine angiography. But octa is highly sensitive and specific in picking up this kind of uh, patterns on OCT angiography. So let us look at one case here where it was referred as chronic CSR with subretinal fluid and for photodynamic therapy to me. But when you look at the OCT in the other eye, you see this pachychoroid features, thick choroid, dilated outer choroidal veins compressing the choroidal capillaries. And in, the, in this eye of our concern, that is the left eye, you see this shallow irregular PD or flat irregular PD called as piped. And this piped overlies the area of pachy vessel with choriocapillary compression and choriocapillary ischemia. And when you do an octa in this case, the superficial plexus normal, the deep capillary plexus normal, but when you do the avascular outer retina slab, you see this filamentous ball of wool kind of pattern, which signifies the presence of a type one 
neovascularization in the setting of a chronic CSC. This was a chronic CSC, but it picks, Octa picks up uh, a neovascularization in the deep avascular slab. So if the diagnosis changes, you have a neovascularization corresponding to the piped or flat irregular PED, and that corresponds on the octa uh, deep slab. So you, you are looking at a cr uh, chronic CSC with a type 1 CNVM. So octa is highly sensitive and specific examination, and it is non-invasive in picking up this type 1 neovascularization, and we get a diagnosis of uh, in CSC in, in the setting of pachychoroid C um, uh, kind of uh, situation. To summarize, now central serous chorioretinopathy is considered to be a choroidal disease, part of the pachychoroid disease spectrum, and uh, uh, choroidal vascular hyperpermeability as seen on ICG angiography and increased choroidal hydrostatic pressure as evidenced by Swepsol's OCT by the presence of dilated outer choroidal veins. Uh, now it is um, uh, known to be a pachychoroid disease, and when you have octa, showing a choriocapillary ischemia, as well as the important finding of abnormal choroidal vessels, signifying the presence of choroidal neovascularization in the setting of chronic CSC, and intervortex anastomosis and congested vortex vein ampullae, as seen on ultra-wide field ICG, suggest a choroidal venous outflow stasis, and recently reclassified under venous overload choroidopathy spectrum, along with ULA fusion syndrome with a unifying pathomechanism, and imaging of uh, choroidal venous outflow uh, abnormalities. So thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. George. And since uh, Dr. V. R. Sarvanan is absent today, he could not make it because of illness. Uh, we'll conclude this session. But before that, if somebody has a question to any, any one of us, please go ahead. <coughs> I have one question, Dr. George. Common problem we face with the CT OCT alone, the early stage of VTH and the macular polyretinitis and the CSR. We have seen lots of patients treated as CSR, <coughs> and the early one we landed with a macular scar basically. So, do you have any uh, suggestions? Yeah, about because treatment? here the s thing is, when you have to rule out a choroiditis versus fibrinous exudation in CSR, oh, one condition uh, steroid is the treatment. Other conditions, steroid is contraindicated. So it's extremely important doing a multimodal imaging in the kind of cases which we I have shown initially misdiagnosed to be a fibrinous variant of CSC and then turned out to be a Harada's disease or vice versa. The case happens to be a bullous CSC with fibrinous exudation and initially diagnosed as uh, uveitis. So because choroidal hyperreflective foci Subretinal exudation can be common to these diseases. So, I mean, it is a multimodal imaging that is very important because OCT, enhanced depth OCT or subsource OCT along with uh, ICG angiography. So, uh, and probably Octa, I don't think, has much role in that, but ICG angiography is very helpful when you do a multimodal imaging because in one treatment is steroid, in the other one is stopping the steroid. So it is very important. And on one clue is, if you see pigment epithelial detachment on fluorescent angiography or OCT, like the case which I showed, uh, that gives a clue to the diagnosis. Unless it is a, uh, you know, steroid responder in the setting of a uh, uveitis. That also can complicate. Sometimes you have a uveitis, posterior uveitis, and you give steroid, and then they develop secondary CSC. We, we, we come across that also. So then, the, then it becomes really confusing whether are you having a primary pathology of uveitis, somebody has given steroid, and then that patient has developed the exudative kind of bullous CSC. So then it is a real challenge, and again, ICG angiography helps to differentiate in, 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 in the two entities like, like what I showed, actually. Yes. You have a question? Switch on, switch on, switch the, on mic. the mic. Stop. Okay, I want to ask what cases uh, do you prefer aplerinone in CSS? And yeah, uh, uh, actually, we had looked in, we have actually done a study uh, and published it as well. We did 
uh, one arm we did uh, half dose photodynamic therapy another arm we did eplinaron uh, and around 60 eyes with chronic csc and tried to look at uh, 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 and the success rate was very high in pdt arm and only 20 percent success with eplinaron so that study showed that uh, eplinaron efficacy was similar to placebo actually uh, but, but we are not great fans of eplinaron but one particular indication where I have found uh, usefulness, that is the only indication now, where I found it to be useful, is steroid-induced CSC. Steroid-induced CSC sometimes can present with a very severe form of the disease. It can be uh, with multi multifocal leakage, it can be uh, fibrinous CSC, it can be even exudative RD. So in that situation, not all, but at least 50% of the cases, not only stopping the steroids, that will take, sometimes after stopping the steroids also, it doesn't go away. In that, what we are doing is, one is corticosteroid induced, we are giving an anti-mineralocorticoid thing. So that, we have a series, we are going to present it in the next, uh, one of our fellows will present in the next meeting, wherein we have stopped the steroid and put on an anti-mineralocorticoid antagonist. And that shows good response. And also, I think uh, where choroid fluid accumulation is there, that cases should respond. Yeah, also. but then uh, yeah, that could actually in our study, where in uh, uh, posterior choroid loculation of fluid, we have a uh, few patients who have responded. But when where when some forum where I had presented, uh, is that the case where it works? Some cases it doesn't work. So I don't know. I mean, we do not know who uh, that I cannot say. But this particular indication, it works actually also. At least in 50 to 60 percent of the cases. Thank you very much. Yeah. Please be yeah, out. Yeah, actually, uh, yeah, you can you can speak into that. Yeah. Because of apnea, that we follow sir. With yeah, apnea. the ideally uh, we start with 25 milligram you know, uh, one week, and then make it 50 milligram, and then see the response. Uh, usually in two months, it should start responding. But the thing is, uh, we have published also uh, in, uh, I think it was published in British Journal of Ophthalmology, wherein only in 20% it really works, except for the indication what I told you. But there are cases, nearly 50% in even in the steroid-induced bullet CSC, exudative RD, doesn't work. Ideally, to in my hands, 90% of all bad exudative uh, PDT works wonderfully well. That is the magic for this disease, actually. But that, that's, a, that's the only indication. Uh, even I am doing PDT now also. Last week also, Monday also, I'm going to do two patients. So, but in limited availability of the thing, but we are going to manufacture it and it will be available by Jan. We are going to manufacture the Visudine dye. So, but that is the gold standard for this treatment. One sitting and for life, no recurrence, actually. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. George, for enlightening us about CSCR and uh, the treatment as well. And uh, I'll, uh, I would invite any more uh, queries if you have before we conclude. And uh, let's all join for a photograph. Photo shoot